just going to talk for these moments about what's the difference between a Christian and the disciple. And uh, it's real interesting in the New Testament, you may have never thought about this, if you wonder how much the Bible has to say about being a Christian, remarkably little. The New Testament only has the word Christian in it two times. And both times it's a kind of nickname, kind of a pejorative nickname for followers of Jesus that was uh, used to label them by folks outside the faith. The Bible has very little to say about what does it mean to be a Christian, how do you be a Christian, uh, but it has a lot to say about disciples. And in fact, the word disciple is used about 268 times in the New Testament. So Christian, two times. Disciple, 268 times. So we're going to talk in this session about what's the difference between a Christian and a disciple, and why is the New Testament, why was Jesus so interested in producing disciples, and what does it mean for you and me to be a disciple? And what I'd like to do is to start with this question, and I'll give you a minute or two to ask it around your table. Um, and the question is, what is the gospel that Jesus himself came to proclaim? Now, that word gospel is a real important word, and we all hear it, and we may think we know more or less about it. But, you know, it began with Jesus. And uh, I remember hearing a guy named Dallas Willard talk about this years ago, and I'd never thought about this before. So around your tables, take a minute or two and um, uh, just think about this question. And then, Heather, if you're still here, if I can get that flip chart up here for this talk, that would be super helpful and a marker. But the question is, just turn to folks around your table and um, take a shot at this. What's the gospel, not just what we think of the gospel, but when you think about Jesus, what's the gospel that Jesus himself came to proclaim or teach? If somebody was to ask you, what's the gospel that Jesus articulated, what would your answer be? So round the tables, take a minute or so to take a shot at that one. Okay, I'm going to stop that conversation now. I want to read a number of passages from the Bible. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to them, the first one is in Mark 1. Or if not, you might write these references down and then uh, take a look at them in your own study time at some other point. But actually, the New Testament is super clear about what Jesus' message is. Uh, it's summarized in all of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are real careful about this. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 14, it describes the beginning of of Jesus' ministry, and so it gives kind of a summary of how to think about his message, like an executive summary version. After John, that is John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Now that's the word where we get the gospel. Gospel just means good news. In the Greek it was a uh, little tiny uh, particle you, which means good. We get words like euphemism from that. And then angelion, message, we get words like angel from that. The euangelion, the good news, the good message. After John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. What is the good news of God that Jesus proclaimed? The time has come, Jesus said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Mark, and then... Matthew and Luke also very careful about summarizing Jesus' basic message. And his good news is that the time has come and that the kingdom of God has come near. Therefore, repent and believe the good news. Now, in Luke chapter 8, again, if you're taking notes or you want to follow along, Luke chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, Jesus has now assembled his little team of disciples, his small group. And we're told after this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another. And then again, we're told what his message was, proclaiming the good news, the gospel of the kingdom of God. The very next chapter, Luke 9, verse 1, Jesus is going to have his disciples go out and teach. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons, to cure diseases, and sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. And then... The next thing Jesus does is to send out the 72, 
And we're told that he does the same thing. He tells them to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus goes through his life. He teaches about this. He's crucified. He's resurrected. After his resurrection, this is Acts chapter 1, verse 3. He showed himself to these men and gave many proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And then Jesus ascends into heaven, and the disciples are sent out to change the world. The very last glimpse that we have of them at the end of the book of Acts, last chapter, last verse, Acts 28, verse 31, talks about the Apostle Paul. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if somebody asked you the question, what was the good news, the gospel that Jesus himself came to proclaim, and you had to choose one phrase that was involved in Jesus' gospel, what would that one phrase be? Take, take a wild guess at this. You won't see most of these people. You don't care if they think you're right. The kingdom of God. His message, his good news is that the kingdom of God now, we'll say more about that in a moment, like what that is. But life in God's presence and God's power and God's favor and God's reality and God's goodness is now somehow through Jesus available to the human race. And anybody who wants to now through Jesus can just walk right into this reality. And this is the greatest invitation, the greatest offer ever given to the human race. That is Jesus' gospel. Now, here's why this is so important and why I believe it is terribly terribly tragic in churches in our day, many, many people have substituted Jesus' gospel with another gospel, with a kind of perversion of the gospel, which is this, that the gospel is the minimal entrance requirements for getting into heaven when you die. Okay, we don't usually put it in those particular words, but many people's idea of the gospel is that the gospel is the articulation of what are the minimal entrance requirements for getting into heaven when you die. And as long as you have achieved those minimal entrance requirements, then you have become something called a Christian. And that's the main thing. You've gotten the heaven job done. Now, whether or not you want to be a disciple, whether you want to be somebody who actually follows Jesus, that's another deal. But the main thing about the gospel is that it allows you to get the heaven job done and satisfy the minimal entrance requirements for getting into heaven when you die. And I'll have a picture that I use for this sometimes. You are all too spiritual to have ever seen this movie, but there's an old movie called Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And um, uh, there's this one scene towards the end of it. Again, goofy, goofy scene, but it just gives a great picture of how a lot of folks in our culture, even people that don't go to church, how they think about the gospel and what they think it means to be a Christian and why Christianity feels so exclusive and superficial to folks. End of the movie, Arthur and his knights, they've been looking for the Holy Grail, and they come to this castle where it is. It's the summit of their quest, but there's this giant chasm between them and where the castle is. There's only one bridge, one way to get across that bridge, and there's this weird kind of wizened old bridge keeper, and he will ask them three questions. Some of you remember this? And if they get the answers right, then they get to cross the bridge and they get to the grail. But if they get the answers wrong, they're cast down into the abyss where they will perish. So the first knight comes up and he's asked, what's your name? What's your quest? What's your favorite color? He's amazed the questions are so easy. He gives them all and he gets to cross the bridge. So the second knight now is really cocky about this. And he comes up to the bridge keeper. What's your name? He gives it. What's your quest? He states it. And then what's your favorite color? Or, no, then he's asked some real obscure question, like, who won the World Cup in 1948? And he says, I don't know. And he's cast down into the abyss. Ah. So the third knight now is terrified. And he's asked, state your name. He does. State your quest. He does. And he's asked, what's your favorite color? But he's so nervous, he says, red. No, blue. Ah. And he's cast down into the abyss. So now it's just Arthur. The bridge keeper asks him, what's your name? Arthur, King of the Britons. What's your quest? Search for the Holy Grail. And then he's asked a question that's a running gag through the whole movie. What's the airspeed velocity of a coconut-laden swallow? And he gives an answer that's also part of that gag. Uh, well, it depends. Is it an African swallow or a European swallow? And the bridge keeper says, I don't know that. Ah, and the bridge keeper is cast down into the abyss. Now, a lot of people's understanding of the gospel is that when you die, you will appear before somebody, and there'll be this chasm, and there'll be this bridge, 
And there's the castle on the other side. There's the pleasure factory. And the gospel is the correct answer such that if you give it, they have to let you cross over to the other side. The gospel on this understanding is the announcement of the minimal entrance requirements for getting into heaven when you die. Here's the problem with this, guys. When in the gospels does Jesus ever say, now I will proclaim for you the minimal entrance requirement for getting into heaven when you die? He never does. He never says anything remotely like that. He has a gospel, and it is terribly important, and it has very definite content. But the content is not, here's the minimal requirements for getting the heaven job done. The content is that now, something, some realm, some reality called the kingdom of God has become uniquely now through Jesus. It's always existed. The kingdom's always been around. And Israel became this little people that were uh, specially chosen by God to learn about it, not because there was anything special about them. They were quite ordinary because God just was going to start with ordinary people. And so they kind of kept that dream alive and learned about it. But now through Jesus, something is breaking out. It's becoming available to the whole human race. It's, it's bursting forth barriers of cultures and ethnicities and languages and tribes and becoming available to anybody. And, and, and especially the good news is that people who thought they were a billion miles away from it, lepers and prostitutes and tax collectors and pagans and Gentiles, they can just walk right on into it. Jesus' one message is that life in the kingdom of God is now available And if you want it, then you come and follow me. Now, of course, this includes the promise of the forgiveness of our sins as a free gift of grace purchased by Jesus on the cross that we could never earn or merit. Of course it does. Of course it includes the promise that death itself would never be able to defeat or stop this eternal kind of life, and it will go on forever and ever with the God who made us and loves us. Of course it includes those things, but it includes more than that, and it begins right here right now. The gospel of Jesus is that the kingdom of God is now available to you. And if you want it, then you become my follower, my disciple. And if anybody knows of a better offer ever given the human race, you come tell me because I want to know. Okay, that's Jesus' good news. And what's so tragic is in thousands of churches, millions of Christians could not even say what the kingdom of God is. Because it's an odd phrase. We don't have kings anymore. You know, we fought a war hundreds of years ago to get away from that. So let's talk for a few moments about what does it mean to speak of the kingdom of God? Because it is so important. And we have to connect the dots so that people understand how what Jesus said actually connects with our lives and our work and what you do. Okay, kingdom is a real important word from a biblical perspective, and everybody has a kingdom, okay? Everybody has a kingdom. Technical phrase for this, and a lot of what I say, uh, yeah, I mean, it goes way back to the Bible, but Dallas Willard is a guy that I learned much from, so just to let you all know about that. Dallas's phrase for a kingdom is, the, your kingdom is the range of your effective will. Your kingdom is the range of your effective will. That is, your kingdom is where what you say goes. It is where things are the way that you want them to be. Okay, that is the range of your effective will. That's your little kingdom. And you have a kingdom, and I have a kingdom. Having a kingdom is a deep part of what it means to be human. And this goes way back to the book of Genesis. See, all the Bible is tied together in this way. Genesis 1.26, God makes human beings in his own image. He created them male and female. He created them. Some of you remember this. And then he said, and let them exercise. Anybody remember the next word? Dominion. See, that's a kingdom word. Then we bring our will, our freedom and creativity to bear for the good. That was God's plan. Now, that little will, your little kingdom, is essential to your personhood. And one of the marvels of watching a baby grow is seeing them discover they have a kingdom. And this is a wonderful and painful process for any parent. 
When a child is two years old, what's that kid's favorite word? No. What's their second favorite word? Mine. What's the CEO's favorite word? No. Or possibly mine. Wait, it's, see, a two-year-old is learning, I have a kingdom. I have a kingdom. But now the problem is that my kingdom interferes with your kingdom. And again, this starts real early on. Any family can see this. You don't have to believe the Bible to see this. Look in the back seat of any car. If you have more than one child in a family, what do they do? They start to draw a line in the seat on the car because this is my kingdom and that's your kingdom. And you better not cross that line because if you do, you're coming into my kingdom and I will not like that. And they start fighting over the kingdom in the back seat of the car. And when the noise gets loud enough, dad turns around because whose kingdom does dad think the car is? He thinks it's his kingdom. And dads say the stupidest things like, do you want me to come back there? And kids, of course, no. You know, going 85 miles an hour down the expressway, I don't think that's going to happen. So they keep squabbling until dad sends his hand back there like Mr. Snake, you know, to, to bring justice until the kids retreat to the farthest corners of the back seat. Ken Davis says, a little tap on the brakes brings them right into play. Okay? <laughs> Thy kingdom come. That language goes way back there. Um, now, we all have kingdoms, and, and part of, it's a real important thing that we do, but part of the difficulty is that our kingdoms are um, all messed up, all twisted and distorted and made hurtful and damaging because of sin. And this is one of the great reasons why leadership is so challenging. And, you know, Jesus had an enormous amount to say about leadership. And, you know, that ministry that Phyllis helps to lead, lead like Jesus. How do I lead with his head and his hand and his heart and his habits? The reason that's so difficult, the reason Jesus had so much to say about leadership is it's so hard to lead people without violating their kingdom. It is so hard to lead people without violating their kingdom. And that's why the workplace, which can be so wonderful, because we were made to exercise dominion. Now, that's all that work is about. Work is about exercising dominion, using our creativity and freedom to bring good to God's creation. And we were all made to do that out of our will. But it's so hard if you're leading something. And I mean, that's part of what I do every day. It's so hard to do that without violating people's dominion, without trampling over their wills and coercing them or intimidating them or appealing to the wrong stuff in them and flattering them and so on. And that's why Jesus had a lot to say about leadership. But over and over he'd say, we don't do it the way that the Gentiles, the godless people do. We don't do it, we don't lord it over them. Okay? So, there are these two kingdoms. There is, if you take all of our kingdoms, your life, your body, your, your kingdom starts with your body. That's what a two-year-old is learning, that my hands and my feet will do what I just tell them to do. Okay, That's why it's so important that you have a body. That's the beginning of your kingdom. But what's so amazing about human beings made in the image of God is that we're able to extend our kingdom in ways that are almost infinite beyond any other kind of creature. Okay, a kingdom is a system of personal power. A kingdom is a system of personal power. And we long to extend that. That's a good thing. We were made to long to extend that, but they're junked up by sin. Now, your kingdom merges with your spouse and, and your family. That's a little kingdom. And then your neighborhood, and that's a little kingdom. And then your city, and that's a little kingdom. And your company, that's a little kingdom, see. And a nation and multinational corporations. And this is just biblical language that we all have to understand to be disciples of Jesus. All of these kingdoms merge and intersect and mingle with each other. And they are what might be called, if we were going to use biblical language on this, The kingdom of the earth. That's the kingdom of the earth. And then Jesus says, there is also in existence, and it has always existed, the good news is not that it has suddenly come into being, it's become available, but, but there is the kingdom of God. Question, how are things going in the kingdom of God? 
Things are real good in the kingdom of God. Paul says in Romans, uh, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of legalistic eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy. And Jesus is constantly, he's constantly talking about how good the kingdom of God is. Much of what Jesus does, and we have to do this as disciples, much of what Jesus does with his disciples is to correct distorted ideas of what the kingdom of God is. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Because anytime someone sees the kingdom of God for what it is, we want it. We want it more than we want anything else. To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like a man who finds a treasure buried in his field, and in his great joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. It's like a pearl of great price. Jesus would often talk about the kingdom of God, and he would use stories about money. Why would he use that? Because we all tend to want money. Because we watch TV shows called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Who wants to? Everybody wants to be a millionaire. To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? When Ace and I went on a blind date, uh, after it was over, I wanted to go back out with her, but the couple that had introduced us lived 2,000 miles away. They were gone. The only way I knew of to get a hold of her was to call the church where I knew she attended. I was a pastor at First Baptist Church of Lacrosson, and I knew she went to Whittier Area Baptist Church. So I called that church up, and I said to the receptionist, I need the phone number of one of your parishioners. Her name is Nancy Berg. That was Nancy's maiden name. My name's John Ortberg. I'm a pastor at First Baptist Church of Lacrosson. It's kind of a ministry thing, so if you could give me her phone number, I would appreciate it. The receptionist put me on hold for like five minutes before she came back on. What I didn't know then, didn't find out for another six months is, the receptionist at that church was Nancy's mother, Verna Berg. She actually put me on hold. I called Nancy and said, some guy is asking for your phone number, so I give it to him. To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like a man who meets a woman and he wants her phone number so bad he will do anything to get it. Jesus would tell these stories about the kingdom of God, and the point of it is that when you see the kingdom of God, you want it more than anything else. There's this fabulous verse in Matthew. The old King James puts it like, the kingdom of God enters by violence and violent men take it by force. What does that mean? That sounds weird. Okay, people were seeing that happen in Jesus' day. When they saw the kingdom break through in him, when they saw that love and joy and peace and everything that I think that I want when I'm going after money because I get a little burst of gratification or after sex because I get a little burst of gratification or after having other people approve of me because I get a little burst. Everything I think that I want through those things, but they always hollow out, is the life that's available to me right now in the presence and power and favor in the will and the reign of God. And when people got that, they would tear holes through roofs in houses to get to him. They would climb up trees just to get a glimpse of him. Women would fight through crowds just to get a hold of his garment. People were watching that. People want the kingdom so much that it's coming by violent, and violent people are taking it by force. They go and sell everything they have to come and follow this man. And they don't think that it's a heroic step. They just think it's sanity. Okay. That's the kingdom of God. And it may be your best idea. It may be the, the next best idea is i got to go back and, and read again the teachings of Jesus and understand what would my life look like here so that I want it more than anything else. Okay, we talk a lot about visions. If you lead a company, you talk a lot about vision. The most important vision in the universe is not the vision of what I'm going to do or you're going to do or your company is going to do. The most important vision is not a vision about what will be. It's a vision of what already is. most important vision is not a vision of what will be. It's a vision of what is, and that's the kingdom of God. And the sign of a healthy vision is it evokes unforced desire. It evokes unforced desire. And that's why Jesus spends so much of his time with his disciples correcting distorted ideas about the vision of the kingdom of God. Another saying of Dallas that I love is this, uh, spirituality wrongly understood or pursued is a major source of human misery and rebellion against God. Spirituality wrongly understood or pursued is a major source of human misery and rebellion against God. 
spirituality rightly understood, you will want it so much that you will say, I must have that. And, and not because, not you know, you're this champion of commitment. See, this is a real important part about understanding what does all in mean. And we live in a day where sometimes people will talk or speak about commitment as if it's this heroic deal. And then it becomes like this comparative thing or like, man, I'm going to show how committed I am. When Jesus would talk about commitment, it was like the story of the treasure buried in the field. And the man went, and in his great joy, he sold everything he had. He was all in. But if you'd have asked him, he wouldn't have said, man, what a heroic thing I'm doing, how sacrificial. In his great joy. It's like, what idiot wouldn't sell everything they've got if it's worth $5,000 in order to acquire a field that's worth millions? So that's the kingdom of God. Then there's this thing called the kingdom of earth. Question, how are things going on the kingdom of earth? Not real well. Not real well. A million Syrian refugees flooding into Lebanon, and we watch and don't know what to do. Thousands of children dying every day from malnutrition and preventable causes. And it doesn't have to happen, but we don't know what to do. Anybody follow the controversy going on in the NBA right now and statements that came out and, you know, racial divisions in our country that go back because of centuries of sin that have still not healed? Things are really bad here. So Jesus had this plan. And he talks about it quite a lot. It's expressed unforgettably in the Lord's Prayer. And it's amazing to me how, uh, how clear and simple it is. But for me, I grew up in the church, how much I didn't know about it. Uh, Lord's Prayer, you all have heard about this. Ken Davis tells a great story about the Chicago Bears. Back in the 80s, the Bears had a great team. Some of you guys might remember Walter Payton and Jim McMahon and Mike Singletary. and Mike Ditka was the coach. and They were having a chapel meeting, Ken Davis writes, and the chaplain was there. And Ditka asked one of the team members to recite the Lord's Prayer. It was a guy named the Fridge, Refrigerator Perry. Anybody remember Refrigerator Perry? And Jim McMahon, the quarterback, kind of a character, leaned over to the chaplain and said, there's no way the Fridge knows the Lord's Prayer. I will bet you 50 bucks that the Fridge does not know the Lord's Prayer. That was kind of an odd thing to bet on, but the chaplain thought, you know, that's maybe the way that the bears roll. So he said, okay, you're on. Everybody bows their heads, close their eyes, and the Fridge begins to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Jim McMahon shakes his hand, pulls out $50, and said, man, I was sure he didn't know the Lord's Prayer. Okay? You have to think about that one for just a moment. Okay, this is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is what we were to pray. Not, there's another prayer that I think Christians tend to pray a lot. Anybody know an old TV show called Star Trek? And if anybody got in trouble on Star Trek, this would always be their cry, their plea to a character by the name Scotty. They would say, beam me up. In other words, Scotty, get me out of here so I can go up there where it's safe. Jesus did not pray, God, you know, Get me out of here so I go up there. He said, pray, God, make up there, come down here. He didn't say, now you all be Christians and pray, God, you know, I know you're going to come and torch this place and destroy it, and I hope it happens soon, and I just want to satisfy the minimal entrance requirements, so help me get out of here so I can go up there. He did not say to pray that in the Lord's Prayer. He said, pray, our Father, who art in heaven, and that means all around us, not someplace way out there, or closer than the air we breathe. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That is, may your character be loved and cherished. Your kingdom come. Kingdom is the range of your effective will. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now the question is, do you believe that that can happen? Are you praying for that above all? And would you like to be a part of that? 
See, the goal of a Christian very often is, I want to get out of here and go up there. The goal of a disciple is to be a part of God's great plan to make up there come down here. What would it be like if up there was coming down here to Denver, Colorado, or to Syria, or to the NBA, or to your body? See, every time God is at work through Jesus, uh, Ken was talking on Friday night about being involved in helping to bring freedom to young women that have been trapped in sex trafficking. I have two daughters. When I think about one of my daughters being violated like that, and I think God loves every little girl on this planet way more than I love my daughters. Every time somebody who is a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, says, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to give, and I'm going to work, and I'm going to plan, I want to be a part of helping one girl at a time be liberated from that hell, then up there is coming down here. Every time a business leader says, I'm going to go to a seminar, and I'm going to learn what would it look like to have a mind like Jesus, to see what he sees when he looks at people. What would it be like to have a heart like Jesus, to have his hands, to cultivate his habits in my work life so that the people that I'm working with don't have their dominion violated? Every time I do that, then up there is coming down here. Every time somebody's got some resources, they get a little generous with them. Every time there's somebody in prison who discovers that Jesus is there, and then a prison becomes a place of liberation and freedom and love, up there is coming down here. So the real question is, will you be not just a Christian, not just somebody who thinks they've got the afterlife taken care of, and then following Jesus is kind of optional, now, of course, we can trust God is the kind of person that we can trust to do the right thing in the afterlife through all eternity by every human being that lives. And we leave that decision freely in God's hand. That's part of what it means to trust Him. But what I say as a follower of Jesus is my ultimate goal as a follower is to live the way that Jesus would live if he were in my place. That is a disciple. A disciple is anyone whose ultimate goal is to live as Jesus would live if he were me. My temperament, my DNA, my situation in life, my ultimate goal is to live as Jesus would live if he were in my place. And if you want something kind of sobering to think about, a non-disciple is somebody whose ultimate goal is anything else. A Christian has a goal to leave down here and get up there. Holy cow, i got to end. A disciple is someone whose goal is to help up there come down here. A Christian trusts Jesus to get him or her into heaven when he dies. A disciple trusts that Jesus is right about everything and therefore is prepared to act on the basis of what Jesus teaches. Again, we don't have time nearly to get into this much of evangelicalism has fallen into this horrible situation where we no longer understand by the phrase to trust Jesus what the New Testament means by it. And I grew up in a church where folks would ask one another, have you trusted Jesus? But what we really meant by that was, have you affirmed the right stuff so that you'll get into heaven when you die? The New Testament never means that when it talks about trusting Jesus. In the New Testament, to trust Jesus just means he was to think that he was right. About what? About whatever he said. And therefore, I'm prepared to do whatever he said. And of course, I find out all over the place that it turns out I, I actually don't really trust them. The issue of trust or belief gets real deep. And a lot of times, I think I believe something, but I actually don't. Okay, Peter, when he was with Jesus, and Jesus says, you're all going to deny me. If Peter says, not me, I'm all in. Was Peter sincere when he said that? Absolutely. Was it true? No, it was not. When that moment came, he didn't trust it. See, the whole belief thing, it turns out, you know, there are things that I think I believe, like Peter thought he believed that, 
And then there's a mental map that you have of reality about the way that things actually are. And you never violate that mental map, like gravity. Nancy and I went yesterday for a hike up in the Flatirons. Anybody been to the Flatirons? They were so beautiful. At one point, we were standing like right on the edge of a, a cliff. And Nancy was getting tired, and we were going to turn and come back down. So she turned, but to get a little momentum, she gave me a gentle little shove while she was turning. And that kind of alarmed me, because we're standing on the edge of a cliff. Now, I believe in gravity. Okay? <laughs> Therefore, I never step off a cliff. Because gravity is part of my mental map about the way things are. Okay? So I never, I never wake up and say, I'm going to really believe in gravity today. You all have a mental map about the way that things are, and you never violate that mental map. But it turns out that we are often not even the best judge of what our mental maps truly consist of. Jesus says things like, Paul quotes him in Acts, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, see, as a Christian, I might say, well, I believe the Bible. I believe it's authoritative. I believe it's inerrant. I believe it. Do I really? Is it a part of my mental map the way that gravity is? Because if it is, then you can just check out my checkbook and you find out, well, yeah, I really do believe that. One of the great dangers is there's lots of stuff that I think I believe, but I don't actually believe. And I'm going to, be, I'm going to need help from a community and from God to discover what do I really believe. Because my mental map consists of those ideas that I always act in accordance with. Now, this is why that whole idea that there's a disagreement, say, between Paul and James on the relationship between faith and works is so bogus. What James was recognizing, and of course Paul did too, he just expressed it in different ways, is when James says faith without works is dead, he's just saying your works, what you do, reveals your mental map about how things are. That's all he's saying. Like, do I believe in gravity? Well, you can just check out what do I do when I come to a ledge, and that will tell you whether or not I believe in gravity. Do I actually believe that it's more blessed to give than to receive? Well, don't ask me if I believe that, because it turns out I can deceive myself a lot. Just take a look at what I actually do with my stuff, and you'll find out whether I really believe it. And disciples' aim is not just to have faith in Jesus, it's to have the faith of Jesus. A disciple's aim is not just to have faith in Jesus, is to have the faith of Jesus. That is, it's to say, have the same mental map that Jesus himself had. Uh, last difference, I've got to stop here. I wish I could get more into this. Uh, a Christian occasionally tries to be like Jesus. A disciple constantly trains to be like Jesus. A Christian occasionally tries to be like Jesus. A, con a disciple constantly trains to be like Jesus. And there's an enormous difference between trying to do something, which is where I use my little will, versus training to do something, where I arrange my life around a way of living through which I receive power from the kingdom of God to do what I cannot do right now. So I hope that more than anything else, this is what you find yourself wanting. I hope it for me too. And I hope that our ultimate goal is to be the way that Jesus would be if he was in our place. Because that's what it really means to be all in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you help each one of us now as we think about and seek to live in the reality of this great treasure which changed the world 2,000 years ago and still does when it breaks fresh into human consciousness. That uniquely through this man, Jesus, the reality of life together with you, that nothing can ultimately hinder even though bad things happen to our bodies and our friends and our world. Our eternal destinies are perfectly safe in your hands. 
Help us to see it and want it and pursue it more than we do anything else. Show everybody here, God, the next step in being a disciple, a follower of Jesus. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.